I'm Tony Ruiz, contributing editor at Gold Derby, here with Ian Softley, the director of The Shepherd, uh, which uh, has just been uh, shortlisted for the uh, live action short category at the Oscars. And, and Ian, one of the things that was interesting to me in doing the research about this was the fact that this story, uh, based on the novella, uh, is actually quite popular in like Canada and I think it's even popular in England but it's not as well known in in the United States and so I'm curious um uh what was your first exposure to uh to the material um well I first came across this uh, novella when I was approached by one of the producers Richard Johns who himself had been alerted to the the story by um Frederick Forsyth's agent who was also John Travolta's agent and uh, Frederick Forsyth, known for such thrillers as The Day of the Jackal, had written this book, um, I think about 40 years ago. And it had had a, a significant following, really, in, in different places around the world. Most, you know, uh, in terms of the relevance for our story, it was, uh, it was the, the Christmas Eve, annual Christmas Eve broadcast of the, of the, uh, of the book that had been read um, for 40 years. And John Travolta used to tune in to the Canadian broadcast with, with his family every every Christmas Eve. So it was really that combination uh, of um, John Travolta's agent and Frederick Forsyth having the same agent. And and we were alerted to the fact that John had wanted to do this, I think he optioned it originally 30 years ago. Um, with, and he had in mind the idea of playing the young pilot. And obviously as the years went by, that, that became less possible. Um, but but he 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 let it be known that he would help in any way he could, and I think in his mind at that point he he had the idea of being some kind of executive producer or something. So I met John, and uh, I I did I just asked the question. So had he considered now playing the role of the shepherd, the older pilot? Um, and he said he he hadn't really. It had always been in his mind, you know, many many years ago to play the young pilot. So um, he said, well, look, you know, he knew that I was going to adapt um the story for the screen and he, he said he wanted to have a look at you know the screenplay um and it went through different different um permutations really uh and then it got to the point that that that, that he agreed uh, to play it um but yeah you know i i think it it was i was surprised when i um started to uh research the story more but also to talk to uh, friends and people that eventually worked with me on the film, how many people were familiar with this story? Um, and, uh, and, and you know, with good reason. I mean, it's, it's a timeless, beautiful Christmas story. And, and I, I had read that you had originally thought of adapting it as a feature and that it was Alfonso Cuaron who asked you to, you know, do it as part of, of his, as his shorts for Disney. Yeah, I mean, I've been a friend of uh, Alfonso's for, well, over 20 years. Uh, and I was alerted to the fact that um, he was interested in this story because uh, we share an agent in uh, in Los Angeles, R Robert Newman. But by the time that Alfonso had got in touch with me, um, we'd already kind of gone down the road of uh, of um, a longer form. And, and, and the reason that that happened was, I think when I first spoke to John about it, um, in my mind and in his mind, it was sort of 45, 50 minute and maybe an hour um, for television. Uh, but then uh, Bill Kenwright, sort of the legendary impresario, uh, football chairman, uh, film producer, uh, heard that we were uh, thinking of making this as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a screen version of the story. And, and he had his heart set on it being a movie. Um, he he loved the story, but he also was a big fan of John's, and I think he wanted to, you know, give John another moment um, of uh, you know being in an, an iconic movie. And so I, I adapted it. Um, it was Bill that commissioned, optioned it, and commissioned uh, the screenplay from me. Um, and I adapted it, and um, I think that a lot of people really liked the longer form, but there were still some people who thought it always really it, it, its proper length was as a as this kind of rather exquisite self-contained story um so we we sort of hit uh, uh slow down a little bit on the film project um at the beginning of lockdown where, when so many other independent films really had to sort of uh um uh, be put on ice 
Um, and it was at that point that Alfonso got back in touch with me and said, well, look, would you, would you, if you want to do it as part of my season of shorts for, for Disney, then you can cast who you want and it'll be green lit. And I mean, from that point, it was a no brainer. So taking this kind of story, you know, you, when we talk about live action shorts, we talk about, uh, I talk with filmmakers about you know the the challenges of you know of budget and time constraints on making a short, um, and this has such a set of cinematic feel to it. What were some of the challenges of taking this story uh, and and making it cinematic, but also fitting it into the short form format? Well, I, I think that you've you sort of put your finger on it in the sense that it was a challenge to make it as a short form. Um, specifically because the um, the majority of the story or a large portion of the story um, is as complicated if you do it as a long form or a short form because it's the, it's it's the airborne sequences it's it's the, it's the flight it's the taking off from a snowbound uh, German airfield 1957 Christmas Eve under a full moon then the weather changes you know, which is a huge huge visual effects and special effects uh, demand and then landing in an, an abandoned airfield in the fog. Um, we we had to work out how we were going to cover um, the scenes, which which takes up the majority of the of the story, um, in a single seater aircraft. I mean, there have been other films that have dealt with single seater aircraft where they found a, a, a twin seater that they could have the cameraman or or a pilot in the front, and then a, a sort of a locked off camera. But we weren't able to do that because it was, it was just a single seater that was available. There is a, a twin seater, but the, the, the seats are next to each other. So it always looks like a twin seater. Um, and we knew that there was only one uh, plane flying in the Northern Hemisphere, which was a Nor from the Norwegian um, Air Force. And I'd actually uh, met these guys when I was doing my research for writing the story. Um, and you know, I I spent time with the plane in the plane with them, sort of talking through all the controls and everything. So it was always going to be them that were going to be doing the flying. And they flew over to the airfield. We found this perfect abandoned airfield in Norfolk, which was exact replica of the one mentioned in the story. Um, uh, and it was intact largely. Plus, it had a couple of huge hangars that had been used as film studios before. But we couldn't land that plane um, in in the abandoned airfield because the runway had become too short. They'd cut off the runway. Luckily, we found a, a, an operational RAF air base about two miles away. So we did all the aerials um, with the real plane. Um, and then uh, we had a CGI set with about three different cockpits. But also, I needed to have some exterior scenes where the, our actor, Ben Radcliffe, was actually sitting in the plane. And it was taxiing. So because we couldn't get a full-size plane, um, the art department were, and I were trying to find out ways that we could use just the cockpit and shooting it um, so that we shot past it to a bigger, wide expanse of the airfield. But I was really not that satisfied that we were actually ever going to be able to get that um, to work. And you know, it just it just restricted the shots that I had. So um, uh, it's sort of week by week, the... Um, uh, the art department, led by my longtime collaborator John Beard, just found other bits of of, of, of vampire jet around the country, and so it's from these cannibalized parts, you know, rusty uh, a wing here or a um, you know a sort of uh, a, a pair of um, twisted undercarriage wheels somewhere else. They actually built this perfect replica. Uh, to the extent that you know, I think to uh, it's only somebody who was a trained eye would, would would think that it wasn't wasn't the real plane. So so those were all were, were very big demands on the production, and and as you say, they're they're you, you know they are expensive um, items. So we had that sort of uh, that sort of tension as I think you have in every film between the vision that you have and what money is available, and obviously it being a short. You know, there was less money available than if it had been um, a full scale feature. So somehow I think a lot of it was because we had such a love of the, the project uh, from very, very highly skilled people um, who I'd, I'd sort of a, I'd, I'd attached to the to, to, to the, the film when it was going to be a long form. Um, and they were so devoted to it that they cut their salaries and everybody kind of like really used all of their ingenuity to sort of find ways of, of making this work at 
to a small scale budget, but to keep the, the, the cinematic aspect of it. Because when I read the story, I mean, I, I was, uh, it, it wasn't surprising to me that it, it had been adapted for radio because it really just, re it's a monologue. So, so the radio transmissions are really just readings of the book. It just read. There's no adaptation involved at all. It just reads the book from you know page one to the to the final page. So I I knew I had to find something that found it an, an equivalent uh, sense of excitement and emotion, but with a parallel uh, kind of set of tools for storytelling. Uh, and the and the aesthetic and the photography was a huge part of that, as was as was the music and the sound. And I think that's how we were able to um, that was our intent anyway, to create that sort of similar experience um, to people that read the book. Yeah, it was you mentioned the fact that the book really is one long kind of monologue. Um, and yet in adapting it, you've you've created kind of these these flashes to the pilot who's so beautifully played uh, by Ben Radcliffe that, that his life, his love, uh, all that kind of stuff. Those sequences, I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, are just as important to the film as the airborne sequences. Absolutely. Yes. And there's also, there's a substantial sequence in the third act, which is not airborne at all. And I think that uh, again, that was something that I felt was a, uh, I felt very, um, obliged to 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 try and make work as well as possible because when you have a narrator like you do in the book you're you're um just by definition of hearing somebody's thoughts you feel very close to them because the 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 book is really a, a stream of thoughts and descriptions of, of what's happening to the pilot so you're you're inside their head you're very very um uh, um empathetically attached to them so i had to find a way that we could create that emotion i mean and a, a huge part of that was the performance of the actor and casting the right actor um but but it was also if I, understanding him as a more three-dimensional person who he was his backstory and, and I, there were two elements that i created and emphasized that weren't so so evident in the book one was the relationship with his girlfriend which is a completely new um element in the story but also this idea of, of it being a rite of passage, that he comes of age. So he starts out being rather sort of self-centered, maybe arrogant, and flying for him is just a purely about his own personal achievement. Uh, and, and what happens in the uh, in the experience and, and, the, and the danger and the terror that he goes through is he realizes that we rely on strangers, you know, the, the, the kindness of strangers that also that we are better together, that there are very few things that we do better on our own and that we are interde interdependent as a species. Um, and that he, he understands um, his father's uh, generation sacrifices during the Second World War, which was not at all to do with sort of ego or personal, um, uh, you know, personal satisfaction. It was an idea of that we have to do this for our community. We have to do this for the world that we want to live in. And of course, at the time, it was the question was, you know, do you allow fascism and fascism and all the prejudices that, that were in, in, involved in that to prevail? Or do we say, no, we want to fight for a better world. We want to fight for democracy. Um, and, and I felt that very acutely when I was adapting it because it was during the pandemic. And it was really the first time that I had experienced anything like that in my life that I sort of imagined would have been what, what was the prevailing kind of um, state of mind of a lot of people during the Second World War, which was a very kind of selfless um, uh, uh, kind of um, instinct to... Uh, to preserve other people's health and well-being, not just your own. I mean, isolating would have no benefit on the person who's isolating. It wouldn't make you better any sooner, but it would stop other people getting the disease. So it was a, it was that selfless thing. And I think what happens on the journey is the pilot goes through something similar. He understands that philosophy of, of humanity. Um, and and I, and I wanted to build in a little bit more. Um, I, I think in the third act, there's there's a, there's it's just touched on in in, uh, in in quite a sort of an under as a subtext really the fact that that he maybe had not totally understood his father, and somehow what was happening to him in the course of the story made him understand and empathize with him more. 
Well, and it's one of the things that I think is so beautiful about the film is this uh, this thing, this empathy that you talk about, you know, it, it, we're living in particularly, uh, shall we say, prickly times where there's a lot of cynicism and there's a lot of uh, adversarial interactions um, everywhere. And so there's there was something refreshing about seeing a story that is about hope, that is about empathy, that is about, that has that hopeful bit at the end and i'm curious if that was uh if that was important to you uh there's something almost you know and i say this in the best way old-fashioned about this about this film did you feel that way about it well i, I was that but that was one of the things i was worried about when i when i was told about it and actually when i read it it didn't feel old-fashioned at all it felt so present and current i thought this i thought people will relate to this now because it's about things that are timeless um, it's not really looking back and saying, oh, how quaint. It's sort of, we're very in the moment all the time. We're with the cat, we're in the moment. But absolutely this idea of the kind of hopefulness and how moving the idea of self-sacrifice is in the in the story. And there's self-sacrifice in the in the present narrative of the story, but there's also as a, a, ref, a referral back to previous sac sacrifices that have been made. And people who, who put themselves in harm's way, who risk their lives to help other people. Uh, and I think that was, that's one of the things that uh, just from people that have read the story, but also have seen the film, that's if, if the people that take that away from their experience, that it is that idea that it's very, uh, that they're moved by the idea of that sacrifice. That's the thing that I'm happiest about um, when people see the film uh, uh, and like it. I also think it's, 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 it kind of reestablishes our our desire to believe that miracles are possible. Miracles are possible, but also that there is good in us, and that maybe maybe fundamentally we are good. Um, I mean, one of the things that uh, I reflected on when I was making it is that even though it's a Christmas story, um, it it picks up on a. Uh, 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 an obligation, a sense of obligation that I've come across with friends of mine who who are uh, um, from other religions, um, uh, that the idea of, uh, of of helping out strangers, travelers in distress is is a fundamental to to not just to our storytelling. You know, going back from to the um, uh, uh, to the um, uh, Odyssey. But also uh, the idea of the um, the obligation and the kind of, if you like, the, the spirituality about uh, helping other people. It seems to be really a, a central part of, of 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 something at the core of our our sense of who we are. Well, uh, Ian, it's it's just a fantastic uh, film and so 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 delightful. <laughs> it was it was so unexpected that I just. I just absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, congratulations on the short list. Everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the upcoming award season and stay tuned uh, for interviews with more contenders uh, in the coming weeks. Ian Softly, uh, a great pleasure. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me.